Dios y a la patria cumplir fielmente la constitución y las leyes de la república. Como primer vicepresidente de la república, juro a Dios y a la patria cumplir fielmente la constitución y las leyes de la república. Como segundo vicepresidente de la república, juro a Dios y a la patria cumplir fielmente con la constitución y las leyes de la república. On May 7th of this year, the Panamanian people went to the polls to elect their new president. General Noriega, whose dictatorship has been established by more than five years, decided to annul the election. And the, he decided that because the opposition, the democratic opposition, the democratic people voted by a majority of three to one for democracy, liberty, and justice. Now, after many months of struggle, when the Panamanian people have tried to make effective their own will, finally this comes through today when Nor Noriega's regime is, is coming down. And we, as president of the republic have taken possession and sworn to the position as the two has, vice president have done with me. Those comments once again. And it should take them at least three days to bring the situation under control. Earlier, more than 20,000 American troops fanned out across the country, securing U.S. bases, capturing a bridge, and taking over the destroyed headquarters of the Panamanian Defense Forces. General Noriega is yet to be found, and his hand-picked government insists it's still in charge. The American contingent apparently did not protect a seaside hotel where nearly 100 journalists were holed up. Panamanian Defense Forces conducted two raids on that building, seizing a number of its guests for a short time. The most dramatic uh, incident occurred in the nightclub where I was at, where as soon as they came in, they fired their weapons, forcing everyone down on their hands and knees to crawl out into the lobby. Was and anyone injured? they then started requesting that all, all Americans uh, stand up out of the people laying down. Um, one nice thing to be said about all the Panamanian people that were laying with me on the floor is that none of them uh, made one move to turn me in, although a lot of them knew that I was an American. The Pentagon's official death count remains 12, including one civilian woman related to a serviceman, a dependent. 58 Americans were wounded. Many of those, as you see, flown to Texas to the Brook Army Medical American Center. force strikes dozens of targets simultaneously from one end of Panama to the other. An intense firefight erupts at the headquarters of the Panamanian Defense Forces called the Comandancia, a place where Noriega frequently spends time. Using light tanks over several hours, the U.S. all but destroys the facility. It turns out Noriega is not there. American troops in the same area move to block Panamanian forces from leaving Fort Amador across a causeway to the city. At the same time, U.S. Marines block the Bridge of Americas across the Panama Canal and secure all roads leading to America's Howard Air Force Base. Other forces secure the International Airport, where during the night, thousands of U.S. reinforcements arrive. Down the coast, American paratroopers are dropped in darkness to deal with a force of Noriega loyalists in Rio Hato. Panamanian troops from here helped to foil an attempt to overthrow Noriega in October. Last night, under fire, they never left their garrison. In the Atlantic region of Panama, American troops hit a prison, releasing former PDF officers who had participated in the October coup attempt. One U.S. citizen is among the prisoners released. In the same region, American forces secure an electrical plant, a dam, and go after two other PDF troop concentrations. By the end of today, the U.S. will have 24,000 troops in Panama, double the number it had yesterday. Initially, Pentagon officials say they thought they knew where Noriega might be they thought they could capture or kill him quickly but they did not
Still, when Secretary of Defense Cheney and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Powell came before reporters this morning, they exuded confidence that Noriega, even if still at large, was finished. But as a practical matter, we have decapitated uh, uh, him from the uh, dictatorship of this country and he is now a fugitive and will be treated as such. But to many Panamanians, that is small comfort. They are afraid Noriega might somehow return to hurt them. They are also afraid of the armed thugs who support Noriega, who continue to roam the... As Manuel Noriega's rampage for power swept through Panama, its people suffered under a tyrant out of touch with their needs. Noriega's Dignity Battalion, nothing more than an organized street gang of thugs and henchmen in t-shirts, showed its irreverence for law and order by leading attacks on any civilians daring to show opposition to their power-hungry leader. Ignoring the results of a free election in May of 1989, which named Guillermo Andara as president of Panama, Noriega remained in power. The streets became filled with violence as citizens who resisted Noriega's tyrannical control were savagely brutalized and tormented by the general's henchmen. involvement with the Medellin drug cartel turned Panama into a clearinghouse for laundering money and a way station for murderous Colombian narcotic smugglers. Not even the Panamanian Defense Forces could control a country on the brink of anarchy. hit-and-run invaders rove freely through the working-class neighborhoods of Panama City. Their target? Unarmed, defenseless Panamanians. The senseless beatings were merciless. For their fearful victims, there seemed to be no end in sight. solid week of intense violence and looting, Panama found itself with a serious shortage of food, water, and medical supplies. A question that would soon be posed to U.S. President George Bush was whether an attack on Panama was justified. But United States involvement seemed inevitable when an American serviceman was gunned down and another officer and his wife brutally beaten after witnessing the murder. The citizens of Panama were treated like animals with an assault of tear gas and unnecessary aggression. Noriega 
this disrespect and mindless violence toward his own people had to be stopped. The country cried out to have its dignity and humanity restored. Elected vice president of Panama by popular vote, Guillermo Ford was another victim of Noriega's terrorist regime after Noriega continued to ignore the desires of the Panamanian citizens. The country was no longer on the brink of anarchy. It was lost in complete pandemonium. The United States now took initiative and commenced the biggest airlift since Vietnam, coordinating the movement of 7,000 troops to Panama from six U.S. military bases. Paratroopers came from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, along with infantry divisions from Fort Polk, Louisiana, and Fort Ord in California, to join the 12,700 military personnel pre-stationed in Panama. <laughs> Army Ranger battalions from Fort Lewis, Washington, Fort Benning, and Fort Stewart in Georgia completed the fighting team. Operation Just Cause had begun. At 1 a.m. on December 20, 1989, the 82nd Airborne Paratroopers plunged into the night sky over Panama City from aboard 10 C-141 Starlifters. The Rangers jumped at a dangerous altitude of only 500 feet in order to avoid enemy ground fire from Panamanian Defense Forces, who protected the runways of Torquijos Airport on the outskirts of Panama City. Yes, minutos. The Panamanian Defense Forces, or the PDF, were headquartered in a group of buildings known as the Commandancia. This area was the target of the U.S. Army's 87th Infantry's first attack. Oh, are you okay? Shit, they're getting close. God damn, they never give up, do they? City was now under siege. Before long, the PDF troops at the Commandancia surrendered under constant fire from the American Army. People coming up the hill. People coming up the hill. Positions high over the city, AC-130 Spectre gunships, equipped with an impressive array of 20-millimeter cannons, Gatling guns, and howitzers, pounded up to 17,000 rounds of ammunition a minute into enemy positions. Using infrared night vision, the U.S. Marines at strategic roadblocks captured more suspected Noriega loyalists. the fighting. 
Marines scoured the streets searching for Manuel Noriega, who had fled from U.S. commandos trying to snatch him in the last minutes before the invasion. In their pursuit, they encountered a disabled vehicle used by enemy forces to run down a roadblock. heat of battle, U.S. Marines take time to assist the enemy wounded with the finest medical attention available. Without a thought, the Marines risk their lives to ensure the safety of others. On closer inspection of the enemy vehicle, another casualty is discovered. Throughout the night, PDF prisoners and their wounded are taken from every district in the city. U.S. troops created a virtual blitz against Noriega's guerrilla battalions. Alexander, As dawn neared, Task Force Red continued to meet fierce resistance in the takeover of Torrijos Airport, as well as the armory at Rio Hato. Special Marine troops and Task Force Semper Fidelis seized the Bridge of Americas, blocking the only access into Panama City from the west. After a long, hard night of battle, the victorious but fatigued U.S. military was ready for a much-needed rest. of day, the damage of the first night's siege could be assessed. The Commandancia appeared to suffer the heaviest loss. Anti-American graffiti was discovered within the enemy command post, which had been completely gutted. Windows shattered, vehicles obliterated, concrete walls, now piles of rubble and dust. The burned-out barracks would no longer be a refuge for Noriega's PDF. The destruction of the Comandancia was a clear indication that the empire of Manuel Noriega would soon be eradicated. But Operation Just Cause was far from over. Manuel Noriega still eluded the military. During the night, elite U.S. Navy SEALs parachuted into the Pacific Ocean. Their goal? To prevent the escape of Manuel Noriega on his private plane kept at Paiatea Airfield. Even though the SEALs faced fierce resistance, they nonetheless captured the airstrip and crippled Noriega's aircraft. But at the end, four young sailors lay dead. Fearing another night of terror, Panamanian citizens began evacuating the city. They took only a few possessions, fully expecting never to see their homes again. Studs. You're both studs. I hope you know that. Yeah, that's us. We are it. The U.S. military supervised the exodus, bravely risking their lives under the constant threat of sniper attack. As they fired from the now vacated apartments, Noriega's Dignity Battalion gunned down its own people. The city soon became a blazing inferno raging out of control. The beleaguered citizens, unable to escape the city, sought shelter, caught in a war they never asked for. U.S. dominance was clear, though, as PDF and Dignity Battalion prisoners were rounded up and held until a ceasefire could be reached.
effort to restore order, U.S. military forces patrol the streets, safeguarding citizens and putting a stop to the looting. Meanwhile, tensions were running high at nearby Torrijos Airport as the battles raged on. Panama City had been secured, the United States set its attentions to the surrounding countryside. There, the strategy would be to eliminate the enemy by deploying the Army's impressive AH-1 Cobra attack helicopter, capable of firing an awesome 6,000 rounds of ammunition per minute. American troops from neighboring airfields was the UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter, with armor so thick it could withstand numerous PDF attacks. The battle in Panama would be the first for many U.S. soldiers. The reality of this war would at last be the true test of their rigorous training. Using airstrips crudely carved out of the jungle, the UH-60 helicopters dispatched American troops to other points of battle. Motivated by the inherent evil of Manuel Noriega, troops focused their energies on a swift victory, hoping to spare as many innocent lives as possible and oust Noriega to end his reign of terror. Army rangers spread into the countryside to secure several strategic points, including establishing roadblocks at the neck of the Cologne Peninsula, protecting the Galeta Island facility, and disabling multi-engine aircraft on France airfield. Elsewhere in the country, the search for the venomous Noriega intensified. Even though the Marines were clad in flak jackets, they were not invulnerable to fear. I got nerves that are shattering this way. Overwhelmed and foreseeing an impending defeat, many of Noriega's own Dignity Battalion turned themselves into U.S. military personnel, who still took every precaution during the enemy's arrest. Panama was now in a pathetic state, with its leader in hiding and its army surrendering in a swift succession. In only a few short days, war had taken a serious toll. Damage to Panama City was escalating, with block after block of devastation and destruction. At last, Noriega's hiding place had been revealed. How ironic that this devotee to Hitler, pornography, and voodoo would turn to the Catholic Church for sanctuary at the Vatican Embassy. Equipped with its M551 Sheridan tanks, the Army stationed itself outside Noriega's refuge. Okay, right over here is the uh, parking lot. Adjacent right across is the Vatican. You see the two men standing up inside the parking, the open bay there? Directly right across is supposed to be Noriega's room. That is where Noriega is staying, right there. 
Noriega cowered within the embassy walls. Outside, his own people hung this hated dictator in effigy, ready to lynch the man if given the chance. The Army's psychological operations used a different kind of warfare. They blasted the United States national anthem and speeches by President Bush over loudspeakers 24 hours a day. U.S. troops maintained order, preventing Noriega's escape and keeping angry Panamanian citizens from storming the Vatican Embassy. The people called for justice, tired of years of tyranny under a man that used the economy of Panama as his own personal bank account, and disgusted that their country served the needs of Colombian drug lords. As the citizens waited, hours became days. But they would not leave until they saw Manuel Noriega taken prisoner. The military patiently waited 10 days for Noriega's next move, knowing that they themselves had already paid a high price with the 23 American lives lost in battle. At last, on January 3rd, 1990, at 8.50 p.m., the man who was responsible for the economic ruin of Panama gave himself up to Drug Enforcement Agency officials. Noriega was a mere shadow of the former machete-wielding, American-hating dictator who vowed that he would rather die than to stand trial in the United States. Among his possessions that he carried with him into the Catholic Vatican Embassy were voodoo beads, trinkets, and drug money. Stripped of his four-star general's uniform, Noriega was placed in a C-130 cargo plane and handcuffed like a common thief. There he was read his Miranda rights in Spanish and extradited to the United States where he would be tried for drug trafficking charges placed on him in 1988. After days of grueling battle and an agonizing wait for the capture of Manuel Noriega, Panamanians rejoiced in the streets. Justice had finally been served. But it would be the elite warriors of the Army Airborne, Navy SEALs, U.S. Marines, and the Air Force who would walk away knowing that throughout Operation Just Cause, the demanding requirements of a high-risk mission had been admirably met. The country of Panama was now under the democratic rule of its elected president, Guillermo Endara. Still, warriors of any country know it is the result of teamwork and excellent leadership techniques that must blend together perfectly in order to master and shape the face of battle.